And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the man, the man of the hour, the man with the power, the man behind many different incarnations of Era D10, including the ex including the full book version of the upcoming Era Forbidden, the one and only Ed Jowett. How are you, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing fantastic, and mm -hmm. it's absolutely great to be back. You know <laughs> I love talking to you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I reached out some time ago, didn't mm -hmm. I? Right before the beginning of the, of the Kickstarter to say, Hey, I want to talk to you. Yeah. Um, cause you know, I, I, I love, I love chatting with you mm -hmm. about, about the various games, you know, yeah. ever since I got to, got to know you and, and, and we played Era Lost Legend together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, really, really great to be back. So now I will, I will admit we had. The first time that I had you on, we did touch on Era Forbidden a little bit, but that was a kind of all-encompassing the whole of um of the of the Shades of Vengeance library at that time. So I didn't have Yeah, it was pretty new at the time, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't and at that I think the I think the po I think the pocketbook version had just come out around that time. So I, think you're I right. I didn't have a I didn't have a whole lot of um, wiggle room. Plus, there was a bunch of other stuff that was gonna that was gonna occupy time. Um, the big elephant in the room at the time, of course, being the consortium. Um, but what? But because of that, I now have, I now have an opportunity to go a little bit deeper. So before we really deep dive into this, um, would you mind giving the elevator pitch for what? Era the Forbidden is for the benefit of the uh, temple. Of course, absolutely. I, I'm sure the temple is full of elevators mm -hmm. for exactly this reason. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I can envision it. I, I absolutely. That's that's all. All of that image, uh, like just inside, it's just full of elevators going mm -hmm. up and down. Anyway, Era Forbidden is a world where human civilization was going on pretty much like it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, Pre-COVID. Yeah. Um, and suddenly, one day, demons and angels appear on the planet. And you are, you know, as a human, you're, you're watching these two towering forces, literally in some cases, because some of them brought giants with them, mm -hmm. um, fight each other, and, and, and their clash destroys human civilization mm -hmm. humans now they run they hide they try not to get eaten by demons the angels won't go after humans deliberately they don't care but they will trample them if they're in the way the demons that they, they see humans as a food source um very handy when you've got a large large army that's going on a long journey let's find a human settlement and and nom 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 mm -hmm. as you say um so humanity never really did find a way to fight back but what happened by mistake is on these fields of battle between the angels and the demons humans would wander these these places and touch their weapons or or what remained of their equipment mm -hmm. and what happened then is Although not everyone survived, some of them bound their souls to this equipment and became able to use it. And those individuals are known as forbidden uh, because the angels say that this is anathema. It is not something that's okay. And while an angel won't go after a human, they absolutely will go out of their way to kill forbidden. Forbidden are dangerous mm -hmm. in the minds of angels. So the players step into this world as forbidden. And while you are now more powerful than your average human, you have... You, you are on a par maybe with the bottom level of angel and demon soldiers. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you're about, you know, probably 70% of the time in a one-on-one -on -one fight, you'll win. Yeah. 
against the very bottom level. So you can imagine, you know, it's a massive boost in power. Uh, one of my players described it really, really well. It's like the difference between a normal human being a baby and a forbidden being an adult. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make you an angel or a demon or even really reliably able to defeat angels and demons. It just means that you are massively superior in ability to the average human. What the game is fundamentally about, though, is about losing your humanity to gain power. Yep. And I've run a number of lengthy campaigns. Um, I'm actually putting an actual play campaign out during the Kickstarter. Um, I'm releasing roughly an episode a day. There are a few days when I'm not doing it. I'm doing something else. But for the most part, I'm releasing an episode a day, both on YouTube and on the Kickstarter. Yep. And... Being a forbidden does not make you able to just run in and take on enemies. Mm -hmm. it, it is a post-apocalyptic game. It is a game of desperation to a degree. But forbidden, when they apply their abilities in a clever way, can change the course of human civilization that remains. So, you know, they can't fight off a massive demon horde, mm -hmm. but they can maybe warn the humans that they're coming and fight them off long enough so that most can escape. Yeah. Now, when it com now, when it comes to the humble origins of the concept of Era Forbidden, I remember read I remember reading through the pocketbook version of the um kicks of the original Kickstarter and I think it is. I think you had cited one of your, one of the big inspirations was the uh, Darksiders, well, at, what, series of games. At the time, at the time, it wasn't a full quartet as it as it is currently. But Genesis, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I I kind of <laughs> it's it's funny, and I I talk a lot in various YouTube videos I've done about finding inspiration mm -hmm. and this was literally textbook i i was in a situation where i had some free time mm -hmm. doesn't happen to be very often and i chose to spend that free time because darksiders 3 came out yep i decided to spend it playing darksiders 1 warmastered edition darksiders 2 definitive edition so mm -hmm. the two ps4 versions yep and then darksiders 3 and then immediately afterwards after I'd finished doing those three games in a row, I went and watched the new Hellboy movie in the cinema. Mm -hmm. And between those four things, I kind of melded together. And also the, the older Hellboy movies, because I know some people knock them, but I actually, I enjoyed them as, as you know, pop conflicts. That's yeah. all they ever were, really, right? They mm -hmm. were never trying to tell a really, really, you know, deep story that's going to change. The, your moral outlook on existence they, mm -hmm. they were fun and yeah. they were and I enjoyed them and with, with those four things together that was really what pushed me to go okay 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 I have an idea mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I kind of I refined the idea I worked with my wife uh, which was really really nice um, I've never really worked with her directly on a game before she's Seen in the background at a lot of conventions. Mm -hmm. She she is a fantastic facilitator. But she's very creative as well. And it was really, really nice to work with her on building what the world looked like. Because it was someone to bounce ideas off and go, hey, what do you think of this? And she'd go, mm -hmm. yeah. Or she'd go, yeah, yeah, I really like that. And maybe we could do this as well. Mm -hmm. oh. um, and I've, I've done collaborative world building before. I've, I've, I worked with Jonathan Lewis on Everything Powered. Mm -hmm. I worked with uh, Jennifer Martin on Era Survival. And, you know, various others. But, um, you know, I, I worked with Mac in a much closer way. Uh, un unsurprisingly, but rather than having to reach out and contact her and say, hey, here's my latest draft... When an idea came to me, I could just turn around and go, "Hey, what do you what do you think of that? Is that a good idea?" I'm not even sure. Mm -hmm. And then she could she could give her opinion. Yeah. Now, um, when it came when it came to, now, obviously, when it comes to something when it comes to something like um, 
Forbidden. This is this is going to be a game that has equip that has equipment as a um, focus. With that kind of thing in mind, what were some of the things you wanted to emphasize and avoid compared to other era games? That's that's a really good question. Um, what I wanted to emphasize with Era Forbidden. Mm-hmm. It was all about the idea that your equipment shapes your character. Um, it's a theme that I somewhat explored in Era Lost Legend, but probably less so. Um, but all you have to do is listen to some of the actual plays. And I, I know I keep referring to those, but yeah. but I mean, they really are. They are the epitome of the way that I see the game as being played. And if you look at the actual plays, you'll see... That the two main characters, Adam and Stephen, mm-hmm. approach things very, very differently because of the nature of the equipment they have access to. You know, um, Adam with a ranged ability, you know, mm-hmm. of up to four meters, stands back. You know, he he restrains enemies. He he rips them apart. Um, whereas Stephen, with his his chains of of um, the abyss. He just runs in and just just attacks and hey, there goes my headphones. Um, he just runs in and attacks frantically, you know, and and he'll do loads of damage, but also take huge risk. Yeah. And it 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 is it is about being as defined by what you can by what you have as who you are, mm-hmm. and that's one of the things I really wanted to look at with Era Forbidden because. In my mind, as you, you know, as you gain a remnant or even two remnants, you become less human. You know, you're 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 so far above humans that it's almost a triviality to deal with them. Mm-hmm. And this is me playing on that trope that already exists within role playing games. Because let's face it, no one really views NPCs as as really really important. No, right, he... it's kind of like this, <laughs> this thing that already exists to some degree in most players' minds. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, look, we can do, we can do something with that and say, hey, you are so far above above the normal human beings, but also your duty is to protect them. And then when a human being stands up to a forbidden and says no. I'm not going to accept this. The instant reaction is frustration, which is exactly what a forbidden would feel. The, the, you know, the forbidden comes in and says, ah, there are demons coming. There are more demons than anyone can fight. You need to get out of here. And they're like, nah, we're good. We'll be fine. They won't find us. No, no, I'm, I'm telling you, they know where you are and they're coming. Yeah, well, whatever, man. And given that as a forbidden... Almost your calling is to save as much of humanity as you can. To have that and have what... And as you gain power and gain Mm -hmm. remnants as you level up, increasingly humans are like ants to you as well. And yeah, you could probably just kill the guy who says no and make everyone run. Is that the right way to do it? Mm -hmm. It becomes increasingly tempting. Because they're they're not going to be able to hurt you, realistically. That they're not. So, you know, you can just stand in the middle of them, kill anyone you like, and, and they'll all run away and you'll get what you want. But is that the right way for you to do it? And those are the kinds of questions you begin asking with Era Forbidden, particularly as you go stronger and stronger and stronger. And I think that's a really interesting thing to explore. And I have to be honest, there's a little bit of um there's a little bit of inspiration from Bioshock in there. Uh mm-hmm. from the way uh I, I is it fair to spoil Bioshock a little bit? I mean, it's quite I an old think, game now, I right? I think the um we we passed the past the. Past I have an point, I have right? an un, I have an unwritten rule. Af, af, once a game has been once a game has been around for at least one console generation, the uh-huh. um you're, you're the allowed, statute on spoilers is expired because the game the game's the game's over a decade old by the, by this point. So have at it. <laughs> so. The would you kindly? Mm-hmm. 
in Bioshock, which is obviously a very famous part of the game now. Yeah. To, and anyone who's played it, anyone who's played it knows exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And it was a play on the trope of you are a computer game player, so you're going to do what you're told because it's the objective marker. Mm-hmm. Right, and it, it the, the the designers were sat there going, ha, 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 ha. and um and and I think that's hilarious. Yeah. S seriously, I I burst out laughing when I realised what was going on, mm -hmm. because like most people, I assume when I first played it, I, I I hadn't really noticed he was Irish and he was saying, "Would you kindly?" Okay, it's kind of tropish, but you know, fine, cool, whatever. Um, and then you realise that it's actually a trigger word for you, and you actually you're forced to do these things but you're also doing these things because you're you're trying to progress through the game i just thought that was really really fun as an idea and to give that opportunity to forbidden players to kind of be in the situation that their actual character is in as in you know oh this ant says no when i'm telling it you know i'm better informed than him because i've been out there and seen it he says he can fight it. I'm saying that's ridiculous. And he's not listening to me. I, I, yeah? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, am I supposed to talk this guy down? Really? Like, I, but people who are mindful of what they're saying and doing while they're playing will realize that that is how the forbidden will feel. Not just the player, but the forbidden as well. And that... Breaking that wall between character and player is something that interests me a lot. And I think Forbidden was an opportunity to look at that and go, okay, this is a way in which I can do it in one aspect. And say, hey, humans, they're kind of annoying to you because they have their own opinions. Mm -hmm. And mostly, they don't have the experience that you have trying to fight. So they don't they don't see the issues. They they just go, nah, we'll be fine. Yeah. I, I think that's fun. I think that's fun. And now obvi obviously when it comes to when it comes to um the remnants, you it's gonna be split into two camps, um angel angelic and demonic. Um now, obviously, the, obviously, it's not going to be a. This isn't going to be a universal af affair. But visual, putting aside visuals, because that's fairly obvious. What would what would you say would be the would be some underlying themes that that could be fallen back on when it comes to what's to be expected from an angelic remnant versus a demonic one? That's. that's... That's an interesting one. Um, the guidelines that I try to follow are relatively straightforward, in general. And I'm I'm gonna qualify this before I begin because one of the things that the core rulebook will give you is guidelines on how to build a remnant. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm working on writing those guidelines at the moment. It's it's quite difficult to put my thought process into words. Um. Demonic remnants either offer a lot of defense or a lot of attack. But they pretty much are what they say on the tin. Um, you know, you, you get a demonic weapon, mm -hmm. it's going to give you the ability to do lots of damage. Mm -hmm. You get demonic armor or um, a fire rune or, a, you know, or a, a demonic skin you can have. Mm -hmm. Um it's going to give you a lot of defense. Angelic weapons are arguably more powerful. The reason I say that is not their pure stats. It's that angelic weapons and, and armor and equipment give you utility over direct damage. Mm -hmm. So to take two examples, um, to take the examples that are in the... Uh, in the actual play. Mm -hmm. We've got Steven with his Chains of the Abyss. And he is a damage machine. Okay. Um, all the damage he does is basically doubled. Um, 
and and that means that you know he could do he could roll eight damage he'll do 16 damage to something and it even with angels and demons that might not that might not kill them but it's gonna it's gonna put a dent where you know other other things might do one or two damage and that's it then you look at the dagger chain which is adam's weapon it's an angelic remnant mm -hmm. And the dagger chain gives you the ability to use it as a chain. Oh, it does damage. It does a respectable amount of damage. A little bit less than the uh, the chains of, of the Abyss. And not doubled. But he has been able to use it to climb. He has been able to use it to restrain enemies and then rip them apart as he compresses the chain. Mm-hmm. He has almost limitless possibilities for what he can do with this weapon, whereas Stephen, with his chains, pretty much... I mean, he can make them glow and use them as a light source one time. Um, but pretty much, it is a case of hit things and you're going to hurt them. But as we discover in the episode that I released today... Uh, the last episode of the Citadel, mm -hmm. they come face to face with a demon prince. Um, actually, in the campaign, it was modelled off a uh, World of Warcraft boss who I fought many, many times uh, in my time playing that game, mm -hmm. Illidan. <laughs> um, so what what he had is he had knives that he would throw at people that would then spawn fire elementals, and uh, uh, everyone would know that that Illidan. Anyone who's played World of Warcraft mm -hmm. and, and done that fight knows that Illidan spawns fire elementals. Yeah. Very, very annoying. Uh, I was, I should say I was a tank in World of Warcraft, so maybe my takeaways from the fight were a little different from other people's, but... Um, uh, I the, think the fire usually elementals is just getting screamed annoying. at. <laughs> um, well, I was also the raid leader, so I was screaming at everybody. <laughs> okay, okay, then that balances things out. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he'd do this, and he was also extremely tough. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he had two weapons and I didn't, I didn't exactly model them on the, on the war glaives or anything, but, yeah. um, you know, I kind of imagine, you know, he, he, he was more punchy than, than stabby, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. But Steven was trying to fight this guy constantly for about five combat turns and they were all dying. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was only by the apprentice actually sacrificing their life. And not even deliberately, but but a dagger stuck in their armor, mm -hmm. right? And was about to, to spawn a fire elemental. They grabbed the dagger and threw it back at the dude and it buried in his flesh. At which point he then turned into a fire elemental and the fire elementals in this one exploded. It's... So uh, the thing is that touching a second remnant before you're ready rips your soul before it's ready to be ripped again. Uh, mm -hmm. And the apprentice died. Um, and the, the Adam and Stephen were just left to sort of go, whoa, and then run because they realized that the, the, the demon prince was going to explode. But Adam had been damaged, uh, sorry, Stephen had been damaging him for literally five combat turns with, you know, I, I think I got up to 40 or 50 damage and that's less than half the guy's health. Mm -hmm. You're, you're getting nowhere, you know, it doesn't matter how damaging you are. It matters the way in which you can use your remnant to have utility mm -hmm. as well as damage. Yeah. And I I generally see the angelic remnants as more powerful as a result. But the great thing is that if you're a less experienced role player, right, you can pick up a demonic remnant and you will be very powerful. And you will be able to run in and you'll be able to fight a lot more things a lot more easily. But I think, I think that if you want to have true power, it's not about the equipment and the way that it's written in the book. Mm -hmm. It's about the way that you apply what's written in the book to your situation. That's that's where power comes from. Yeah. Now, obviously, you've obviously. Um within the system you have you have it that 
because these are soul-bound items that they le that they level with characters and the leveling part is something I find interesting because when I look at the bulk of your work um a leveling system is not something that is especially common um like what was were there er, were there early versions where you where you tried to do a bit more freeform like the like the um, majority of the other era family or did that or did that just not did was that just not in the um, consideration? I think that the only way that remnants can work is by having a defined path, and while I don't like. I don't like um, a very, very defined leveling progression that you have mm -hmm. to follow because in general that leads to there is only one way to play this kind of character, um, which I, you know, that this is the mathematically optimum way to play the character. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I rail against in role-playing games in general because I don't think that's the right attitude. Um, and I think that in, in Era Forbidden, that flexibility comes not from, I have a remnant, but from what remnant am I going to take as my second remnant? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm actually playing a game at the moment. I, I rarely get to play, but, uh, one of my GMs has very kindly offered to, to run a game for myself and one other player. Mm -hmm. And we've not really talked about this yet, but Era Forbidden works best with between one and three players and a GM. Um, it's a small group story that really is much stronger for it. Because, you know, if you have an army of eight, you, you're, you're at the point where, you know, you run in and, and you're much more able to defeat things. So there are story reasons why that doesn't work so well. Um, it tends to attract, it, attract angels and demons to you, mm -hmm. which is very dangerous for Forbidden. Yeah. Now... But but we're reaching the point. Oh, sorry, we're reaching the mm -hmm. point in in the game that we're playing right now, where I have a melee weapon. My mm -hmm. my comrade has a ranged weapon, mm -hmm. and we're each looking at. We're both level five, so in one level's time, we'll be able to uh, take another remnant. And we've each been looking for a while at what kind of remnant we might want in order to boost the things that we can do. So. When you are a ranged person, do you take more ranged abilities so that you're better at range? Mm -hmm. Or do you take melee to balance yourself out? And I think that's a question that is asked in a way in Darksiders 3, in the way that those, your weapons in Darksiders 3, they level up. Mm -hmm. And I think the way in which they level up is, you know, you literally have two parts. And I did strongly consider having two parts for each remnant. And in the end, I just thought, no, you know what? I think I'm going to go with, let's have the remnants be the choice that people are making, and then they progress those remnants. Yeah. And what I may do in the future, and I am strongly considering it, is I may actually publish an expansion that gives a second track to some of the more, um, I suppose the word I'd use is prestigious remnants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can go down either path, but you're making choices. I feel like subdividing that choice isn't necessary in the core game, but it is also a cool thing to do. Yeah. And, and as I said, I like to reflect the feel of the source material, and that is in Darksiders 3. It's, it's the way mm -hmm. things work. Yeah. So I think I think that reflects the core material very nicely that led me to build Era Forbidden. Yeah. Now, I will admit this is as a as a bit of a humorous bent, but when you mentioned that in the full book there is going to be guidelines to put to um put to cre to creating um new remnants um Immediate, immediately, the the smart Alec part of my brain was thinking, "Okay, let's see how let's see how close they can get to um, 
rep to referencing the weapons in Heretic and Hex and, wi and still get away with it. <laughs> um, of course. Of course. Yeah. Um, I think mm -hmm. that... Uh, I, I want to make it very mm -hmm. clear to people who are listening. Yeah. Um, these are going to be guidelines for how you spec and how you build a remnant. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to talk about what you should have at level 1, what you should have at level 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah. It's going to be a lot more akin to the guidelines for building empowered abilities in Era of the Empowered mm -hmm. than it is going to be here is a step-by-step -step guide for making every single remnant you can think of. Yeah. I will obviously do examples. I will obviously go, okay, this is why I'm saying this. But it is... I've, I've actually gone back and forth about whether this even goes in the equipment section or in the GM section. Mm -hmm. I'm currently in two minds about it. Uh, at the moment, in my bookshelf that I've made, it's in the equipment section. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to say that it's going to be in there. And I might say, look, this is guidelines for you, GM. And at the end of the day, it's it's got to be you who puts this remnant together, and you shouldn't shouldn't let the players go loose with it. I might say that. I I am undecided, genuinely. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to be here are tables and rules and things because if I wanted to give you that, I wouldn't give you forty remnants in the book. Yeah. Um, I'm giving you all of the remnants you really ought to ever need. You know, they'll they'll be a mix of utility, of weapons, of armor, of, of various other bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. And it really, it should be enough remnants. But in case someone has a really good idea, I want it to be enabled. Rather than, oh, you've got to reverse engineer my thinking and figure it out for yourself. And that's really what the aim of allowing people to make their own remnants is for me. Yeah. Now, this now um you're cur you're currently crowdfunding for a full book version of Era Forbidden. Um, when you when you first sat down for to this idea of of taking of taking Forbidden and um expanding it from the um from the forty two page um, pocket rule book into a full into a full on source book, um. What what would what were some of the high priority things that you felt you needed to expand upon? I had at that stage, thanks mm -hmm. to COVID, I'd had the opportunity to play a large number of games of Era Forbidden, many of which were the ones which I'm releasing now mm -hmm. uh, that I'd recorded, but also, not only that, I had played Era Forbidden with with Doug. Uh, the, the GM. And we played quite a few sessions before I decided to do this. And what was interesting to me was, you know, obviously I know the world, I know what I have in mind. But what was interesting to me was the questions that I would ask Doug about what things were like in his version of the world. Because obviously the, the pocket rule book. It's very limited. It's got about three total pages on this is what the world's like, this is what angels are like, this is what demons are like. And that's it. That's all I could fit. And that is... That gives the GM tremendous latitude to do one question. Okay. So in my vision of this world, I think this. But is that the case in your world? And those are the kinds of questions I wanted to answer a lot more definitively rather than leaving them so open to interpretation because sometimes when I ask the question, because obviously I wouldn't say, I think this, what do you think? Mm -hmm. I would say, what is the case here? You know, what, um, do humans worship demons uh, in, in this world? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, you know, and the GM would have to think about it and come up with his position on it because the book didn't adequately describe my view of that. Yeah. And so what I've done is as we've played, 
I have literally written down everything that I have asked or that um, the GM has had to explain. So, you know, he'll go, oh, um, this is a town. It's like this. It's, you know, it's got this population. Um, they've had cows stolen mm -hmm. consistently over the last three years. Mm -hmm. No one really knows why. Just cows keep getting stolen. Okay. Um, you know, you come across a group of people who mark themselves by um, colouring the ends of their fingers red. Who are these people? You know, mm -hmm. what... What are they, you know, what is their trait? What are they like and why? Um, and I'd always planned to have cults that worship demons. You know, mm. so my answer is yes. Uh, some humans have been driven insane by the apocalypse. And, and you know, they, they, they are trying to find order in a universe that makes no sense anymore. Mm -hmm. And... I, I think that providing insight into what groups of humans exist, what what angels really act like and, and how they behave and what kind of military tactics they follow in their war against the demons and how the demons behave and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was a really high priority for me. I really want to make sure that the GM, having read the rule book, is equipped they don't need to answer those questions or come up with their answers to those questions unless they actually want to, right? One of the things that I have maintained throughout when I've run Era Games and then handed over to other GMs, as I believe you know, Mildra, um, there are numerous other GMs on, on my Discord server who run games pretty much constantly. And uh, in the case of Empowered... We jokingly refer to it as Leoverse because it is it's it's one of the other GM's vision of how this universe works. And it's not the same. You know, it, yeah. it is different in certain really important ways. And that's absolutely fine. You know, I can sit down and play a game with Leo running it in Leoverse and I'll go, OK, what's the case for this? Can I make this assumption? Mm -hmm. Because it's not. It's not my universe at that point. It's the GM's universe. And they can agree with me on some points and disagree with me on other points. And that's absolutely fine. I don't believe that my voice is the only answer to the question. And in fact, when I'm sitting there as a player, my voice is not the answer to the question. Unless the GM specifically turns to me and goes, Ed, what is the answer here? I can't be bothered to look in the book. That has happened. That, that has happened a couple of times. Um, unless that happens, my opinion is irrelevant. It's, it is just as irrelevant as every other player. My opinion on what the world is like is defined by, you know, sorry, what the world is like in a game is defined by the GM, not by the players. That's literally the role of the GM. So I, I don't want to say, look, I'm imposing these things and this is the way it is. And that's the way it is. And I would always encourage any gm who faces a player like that to say okay but this is my universe not exactly what's in the book and that's just the way it is because that's the way any game has to be run no one has encyclopedic knowledge yeah um i'm a big advocate of that and i i have been ever since i started running role-playing games because i started running my first role-playing game without reading the rulebook um it was paranoia mm-hmm um, and I'd picked up the tropes of paranoia from playing the game exactly once. My second ever role-playing game, I was the GM. Mm -hmm. Which, um, that's, if the, uh, that's a no-pressure situation if I ever heard one. <laughs> well, paranoia was, was my saving grace there, because it's very thematic. Mm -hmm. Very, very thematic, that world. Um, and not only that, the players are not allowed to know the rules. So, you know, I, I just sat there and I had a single D20 and I just rolled that D20 and I went, yeah, you succeed or no, you fail. Yep. And whether, whether like, I was bullshitting or not, no one ever really knew. Because, you know, I, I could roll in plain sight and not tell them that I would decided to reverse the dice on this roll, you know. Yeah, pretty much. Now, when it comes... Now... 
when it comes to the when it, when it comes to that whole expanding the world, would it be would it be fair to say as well that um because I th I think in the uh, re I think in the recent what to expect video you did mention wanting to put in a map. Yeah. Yeah, I I would like to put in a map now. Mm -hmm. Again, I want to kind of qualify that. I'm not saying that this is the be-all and end-all map of the entire world of the Forbidden. I may do it a little more like Era Survival, and anyone who's looked at the Era Survival map will know that's a continent. Mm -hmm. That is not the world. Like, what is happening outside of that? You know, it's literally one landmass and then a little bit of ocean, right? It's clearly not an entire world. Um, and it's not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Um... I might do the same thing with Era Forbidden. I personally think it's more interesting to have a focused area to play in with lots of detail than a world map, you know, on, on A3, where everything is so tiny you can barely read it. Um, and I, I may well, therefore, do something more akin to a continental map than a world map. Mm -hmm. But I do want to show people, look, hey... Here's where things are. You can find... You know, you can find mountains here, and in these mountains... Uh, you know, there, there is a human settlement where people have been hiding for decades, and they've managed to stay out of the way of all human... Uh, sorry, all angels and all demons. And they managed to stay out of the war, and, and basically survive as a very, very small, isolated town. And I want to be able to look at those places because, you know, imagine a Forbidden going there. That would be a really fun session, right? It's it's suddenly like, oh, I know, we end up here. You know, it, it, we end up there by accident even. How does a group that have deliberately stayed away from the angels and demons react to Forbidden arriving who may attract angels and demons? You know, it's it's kind of like... Uh, okay, convince me that you're allowed to stay here and we shouldn't be firing every gun at you right now. Um, or it could be that they welcome them because mm -hmm. they don't really know what the issue is, you know, what, what the what the danger is mm -hmm. because they haven't been part of the war. But they, they don't know. Um, and the players don't know when they arrive at this place. And I think exploring those places and adding those locations with their own foibles mm -hmm. is a really interesting thing to do. I'm actually in the middle of writing an era survival expansion that is very much along those kinds of lines. I'm writing, it's called Settlements and People, mm -hmm. and it's literally, it's a list of 30 settlements, and who, who's the mayor, and who's... You know, who else is, is important and in charge? And what are the tradesmen like? You know, how, is the, you know, is the medic, do they have an awful bedside manner? You know, but, and it's just all those details that, that a GM would find really useful because it's really hard to stop. I find it really hard to stop things becoming a bit samey. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's just really useful to have that and go, okay, you are coming up to... Black Point. Okay, Black Point. That is, you know, it's a big, you know, there's a big mountain that, that overshadows it and whatever. You know, whatever it is that I come up with and write down mm -hmm. in the in the book. And I want to do that to a lesser degree for Era Forbidden. I've put, a lot, I've put a lot of pages aside for locations in the core rulebook as well. Mm -hmm. So that you can more easily explore the world. And even if you don't want to use the exact locations that I've written... You can get the flavor of what locations feel like in Era Forbidden and what kind of options you have as the GM. Yeah. Now, within the within those locations, that do, that does bring me a couple, to a couple of questions. First, um, with some of the locations that you have written out, do you plan on having a section um, that's basically rumors, in a sense? I absolutely do, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Angel and Demon strongholds are not places that anyone goes. Um, a big part of... I mean, uh, in, again, in the Pocket Rulebook, we had the, the giant sort of world bases of the Angels and the, and the Demons pictured wonderfully by Sophia. 
Mm-hmm. And no one knows anything about what's inside those. It's all guesswork. It's all rumours. And I think it's important to have that because what that does is it maintains the mystery of the world. Everything is not known, right? And it means that when the GM goes in, they can, if you state the rumours, the GM can go, oh, I agree with that. And it and there's our first loss. Don't worry, folks. We'll get him back in here shortly. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, I was, I was worried for. When the GM a... takes mm-hmm. the group into that area, it means that they can either follow the rumors that are written or do their own thing, and they have mm-hmm. total freedom. Even someone who's a bit of a rules lawyer, law lawyer kind of guy, can't look at the book and say you're wrong because it says this is rumoured. Yeah. And I, I think that's really important. Yeah, and that's why I, that's why I phrased it as rumours and not what's actually going on. And the other thing is, I, and I think I asked something similar to this when we were talking about um, survival, but... Would it be fair to say that there that um there's some room for a more um cro- for a more hex crawl like approach with era for era forbidden? So, I am not a big big fan of that kind of gameplay. Mm-hmm. Um, you and I actually discussed this, I believe, yeah. uh, at some point in the past. I find that it focuses people on the wrong things um when when we're playing a role-playing game i want to be focused on the role-playing yeah um not on exactly how far apart people are or or exactly how many hexes you can move or whatever else Mm -hmm. is there potential for it yes absolutely um i'm exploring something that's a little more down that route with a miniatures game that I'm currently working on. Mm-hmm. But I, I I would recommend against it just in general with the Era D10 rule set, because although the support for it is there, I think if you're focusing on your miniatures in the right place and how far apart they are and how many, can I move five hexes to get there? I think I think you're missing the point of the game, because the games are really all about enabling role playing, mm-hmm. not about hack and slash combat yeah. particularly. They're not they're not complicated enough with the mm-hmm. combat, in my opinion, to be exciting enough, to be like okay, here's the minutiae of combat. Yeah. Combat is supposed to be fast and fun and narrated, and yeah, I do a kick jump off the wall and and stab him with my spear. Cool, awesome, fun. It's not like okay. Seven hexes, okay, yeah, so I can get there, and then I'm going to stab this guy, and then I can heal this guy in the same turn, because this rule says so. It's it's not designed like that, it's designed much more narrative. Um, And I think that you would be doing yourselves a disservice, rather than the game, because as I say, the game, it has a speed stat, it has, you know, it has these things that describe how you would achieve that. But I think you'd be doing yourself a disservice to stick slavishly to the rules. I was only just editing one of the episodes of the actual play mm-hmm. where I deliberately broke the rules. Yeah. I, I just went, okay, I want you, you've done your action, now I want you to roll me a double dexterity mm-hmm. um, to see if you can restrain this this automata that you're fighting. Yeah. And he hadn't even thought about it or tried it or or, or intended it. But it was a thing that I thought, okay, well, that's a really good narrative point. Like, you know, he fires this thing into it and then sort of runs around it or or, or does whatever magic to, to make this thing encase it and, and restrain its arms so mm-hmm. it can't stab him. And no, technically speaking, it's not in the rules. It's not there. His turn had ended by the strict letter of the rules. But narratively, it was fun. And I think that's more important. Mm-hmm. Rule of cool. Rule of cool. Yeah. And gi- given how we here in the temple have endorsed the the ancient art of pulling off dumb shit, <laughs> we I have no, I have no 
qualms about about, enfo about enforcing rule of cool. Because, well, we've all we've all we've all tried to get away we've all tried to get away with the whole sneaking in through the vents like we're like we're like we're friggin' John McClane or something. <laughs> Even though, even though actually trying to do that would create too much noise. Yep, yep. We have mm -hmm. all tried to get away with that. Mm -hmm. Some of us have even got away with it. Yeah. Um. Some of us have got away with abseiling down an elevator shaft on the lift cable. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we? <Yes. laughs> um. But when, but um. When it comes now. One of the things I did notice when I looked in the equipment section of the uh, mit of the um, pocketbook is it talks about um, pre it talks about pre war pre war equipment being being somewhat rare and is that is the whole idea of pre war artifacts something that is going to be expanded on in the in the full book and. When it comes to the availability of those sort of items, are you leaving that up to the GM, or are you going to have um, baselines when it comes to avail when it comes to availability? Um, it, not only will each item that's currently in the pocket rulebook be fleshed out, mm -hmm. but um, more examples of items that you might come across. So I know this sounds weird, but my my character in the game. And and my uh, comrade, we together realized that a video camera with a solar powered battery would be absolutely brilliant for us, because what we're technically on is some kind of research project mm -hmm. um, into demon gates and how they open them. Yeah. Um. So you know, a video camera. I, I mean, it, it sounds like such such a luxury. But after we spent like hours writing down notes and, and drawing pictograms off the wall and so on in a notebook, we, we just went, oh, come on, seriously, there has to be a better way than this. Um, and my aim is to give the GM a guideline around how, how you might decide whether an item is available or not. I think that's really important. And mm -hmm. yes, they're rare. They're rare to the degree that, you know, a settlement might have two guns. You know, that kind of rare. Um, between, between everyone, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people in a settlement might have two guns mm -hmm. uh, to, to help defend the settlement. And this is a new kind of... This is a new kind of rarity compared to era survival. Where I don't know, I don't know if you're aware. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm honestly not sure whether you've spoken to me about this. No. They probably have mm -hmm. limited ammunition, yep. but the thing is that they're so rare mm -hmm. that, practically speaking, whoever's using them has infinite ammunition. Yeah. Um. You know, they're they're not going to run out in their lifetime, mm -hmm. which is likely to be very short when the angels or demons come gunning for you. Yeah. I think that there is room for some forbidden who have more, shall we say, utility remnants mm -hmm. to want to carry a gun right uh mm -hmm. you know try and get hold of a pre-war weapon but i don't want them to be able to steal an armful of weapons from every settlement they go to there are there just aren't that many weapons mm -hmm. unless you want a you know a sledgehammer or something sure you know they'll they'll build stuff they'll make stuff there's um in the in the first uh Hang on a really good swords and axes and things. Mm -hmm. um, he makes, yeah, he makes really good swords and axes mm -hmm. and things, rather than, you know, anything that's really really complicated. Yeah. 
I'd almost say the technology has been lost. But, um, again, another thing that I kind of want to build on a little bit, mm -hmm. my character and my comrade, we were initially sort of ruin divers. We, we, we'd go in and we'd go through ruins and we'd try and find things of value to salvage and then sell to the nearest trading point. A technology from before before the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to what we were, we were told in our briefing... Um, before we started the first session, we were pretty good at it. Um, that was that was how I convinced. We're, we're actually on a mission for the angels. Mm -hmm. um, the angels have decided not to kill us, and that they'll let us go ahead and go and research these demon portals because someone has to, and they don't have the 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 capacity or the willingness, frankly. Yeah, it makes and, sense. And that's that's another interesting thing because honestly, angels aren't very curious about it. They're here to fight the demons, and that's it. That's mm -hmm. that's their world. The idea of stopping demons coming in is kind of attractive, but th there aren't really angel scientists, at least not that anyone's ever seen. Yeah. Now, when it comes now, um, when it comes to the uh, G when it comes that give that brings me to an interesting question when it comes to the. Um, GM section because the thing about some the thing about something like Era Forbidden is I could see some GMs being very tempted to play a um play a specific style of adventure within it. Um, and would it be fair of me to say that within the GM section of the of the full book there will be advice on how to um run other run run different types of stories within the sandbox? Yeah, absolutely. And not only that, there'll be examples. Mm -hmm. um, you're never going to end up in a situation where you can run a session sensibly where a Forbidden just runs in rawr, and, and attacks like a hundred angels. They mm -hmm. will just get slaughtered. Uh, outside of trying to violate the rules of the world, and that's just that's just kind of one of the rules of the of the world building there, you should be able to do pretty much anything. I've run sessions that were, you know, go ahead and, and try and convince the humans to leave. I've had go and rescue the, the innocent damsel from the, uh, from the castle. Mm -hmm. I've had um, things like, uh, you know, um, you go in and, and in the episode that we've just finished, they decided to go in and literally collapse and try and destroy a demonic citadel. Small one, but but a demonic citadel nonetheless. Hence, fighting the demon prince, which was really the key to defeating it. Yeah. Um, and I think that you can do a wide variety of stories. Um, and I intend to offer, as I always do in my core rule books, a number of example scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually going to go one step further at the suggestion of um, Doug, the the GM for my current. Uh, current forbidden game that I'm playing um, and I'm actually going to include a session where I literally go through in huge detail what every role might look like what you know what results might give and so on mm -hmm. as an actual really in detail example because one of the things he said that he struggled with when learning the system was just okay how do I know when to ask for a role and it's not really something that I'd ever really considered because most people learn the system by playing, mm -hmm. not by reading the book. Uh, at least most people I interact with, I should say. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of people out there learn systems by reading books, and I really want to support that if that's something that people think would help. And, and you know, I've, I've done a quick polling of various people, and they all said, yeah, I think that'd be really useful. So I'm putting that aside. But also, I want to do a variety of different sessions. We have a good tradition of giving people very different genres from... I sneak in to, you know what, I've got to hold off as much as I can and then leg it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which is kind of the most direct combat you're ever going to get in Era Forbidden. Fighting humans versus fighting angels or demons is another different thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you come across one of these de demon-worshipping cults. What do you do? You know, do, do, do you, you have the ability to fight those people. Humans don't really stand a chance against you. I mean, a a gun can kill you, mm -hmm. but 
Yeah, I mean... Yeah. <laughs> now, Sorry, I mm-hmm. ran out of steam a bit there. No worries, no worries, man. Happens to the best of us. Um, now you now um, currently you had set you had set the goal at twenty five hundred pounds, and you and you're ju- and you're just above that with um twenty seven hundred and change. Um. Now, how ma- Now um, I think you may have hinted this in the what to expect book, but how. But what would you estimate the page count is go- is going to is going to be for um, Era Forbidden? So I'm aiming at around 250 pages. Now, when mm-hmm. I say around, that's sort of plus or minus 30. Yeah. Uh, um, most of my core rule books fall into the into that category. Mm-hmm. Um, Era of the Consortium, Era Forbidden, are 300 pages. Um, Era of the Chosen is about 250. Mm-hmm. Era Lost Legend is about 260, and Era Survival about 230. Yeah. Uh, for the core rule books themselves, mm-hmm. not including definitives. Yeah. Um, and and I think that I'm going to be well within that range. I think I'm going to be somewhere between 220 and 250. Mm-hmm. I don't know exactly. I, I I'm kind of erring on the side of I think it'll be longer mm-hmm. because usually I underestimate the space I need when once I actually get to writing stuff. Yeah. Um, particularly when I when I get the when I get Jennifer or Amy or one of the other writers who works with me a lot on board, mm-hmm. they'll come up with an idea and be like, "I will find a space. I will I will find a way to make this happen. It's too awesome not to." <laughs> um, oh, that's that's what the sledgehammer is for. Um, now it currently it currently has fourteen days to go. Um, put now I realize that a lot of things. Are in are always in flux with this sort of thing, but if you were to sh- if you were to um, ballpark a win- a window for um, for its di- for its digital release at the very least, um, what would that be like? Second quarter twenty twenty one. As you say, mm-hmm. as you say, it's very hard to predict these things. Mm-hmm. Um, as you are aware, because I've said it before, I usually take less time than I predict for uh, on the projects mm-hmm. because I don't want to commit to something and not deliver. Yeah. Now, due to COVID, mostly not its effect on me, but its effect on the rest of my team. Mm-hmm. Era Lost Legend is now with the printer, yep. but it's not going to be delivered on time. It's not going to be delivered during October, unfortunately. It's outside of my control. Mm-hmm. Um, we, uh, I, I don't know how close your listeners have been sort of keeping an eye on Era Lost Legend, but we had a lot of redos of the power webs to make sure that they were absolutely perfect. Mm-hmm. I don't regret that at all. What's happened is I submitted at the beginning of September, which should have been absolutely fine for the printers, and they have honestly completely screwed up at every stage. Um, I still do not have a proof that I'm willing to sign off for Era Lost Legend. Um, which is sad because it is literally the first ever time that I have not delivered on time. Now, I think people are very understanding about that on Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. I think it's only going to be a month late. Yeah. But I am disappointed because this is not something that I really feel is right. And... I feel like I planned it properly and then obviously COVID happened Mm -hmm. and while I made strong efforts to account for that, I did not account for how long the printer would actually take to get their work done. Um, They have been very slow in their operation and don't get me wrong, Mm -hmm. I love working with this printer, I've printed pretty much every book I've ever done with this printer. But it does frustrate me that I am still arguing with them over the position of the ISBN on the back cover. Because I've told them what to do and they've not done it twice. And Mm -hmm. I know that sounds like a trivial point to a lot Mm -hmm. of people. But it's slap bang in the middle of one of the core parts of the image that's on the back cover. And I think that it ruins it. And I'm not willing to accept that. Um... It is virtually impossible to make something perfect, but if you don't fix all of the things that you can see when you print it, 
my experience is that you regret it. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I have always said, and and I say in the risks and uh, risks uh, section, risks and challenges section on the Kickstarters regularly. I am first devoted to bringing you the best product that I can bring you. And I am second devoted to making sure it's on time. And it's sad for me that this is the first time I've ever not been able to deliver both. In terms of Era Forbidden, I am coming towards the end of writing the Era Survival expansions at this point. Mm -hmm. Most of them are with the proofreaders. Unfortunately, uh, one of the proofreaders has had a bereavement, um, and that slowed everything down. So, right now, I am behind where I want to be. Um, It has been a very, very challenging six months for the last six months in purely production terms. Mm -hmm. But... The short answer to your question is that I would like to aim for that, but it it depends a little bit on how well we do on the Kickstarter. Because I'm sure it is not a massive secret to most people that £2,500 is not the whole story for building a core rulebook. Oh, yeah. Um, there is a lot more expense that goes into that. And what really affects the the time to completion more than anything else is the amount of money that I have to bring in myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, so I'll run the Kickstarter. We'll get what funding we get and I will deliver it. But if I need to wait two months for, for paychecks so that I can pay artists to get the rest of the artwork, then that's obviously a delay. Artwork is one of the things that takes the longest I've not even spoken to any of my writers yet about whether they'd like to work on Era Forbidden. Um, We are working on a number of other projects, which include audio projects and uh, comics. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're all in various stages of completion. But the writers at the moment are both busy. Well, all three busy. Um, All three of my main writers. And, And my proofreader, my first run proofreader, absolutely fantastic writer as well. Um, she is obviously very, very busy with Era Survival yeah. at the moment um, because I want to make sure I deliver it. So I realized that that was a very long answer to a very simple yes or no question, <laughs> potentially. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to give some insight to, to the mm-hmm. people who are listening about why I'm not answering that question. Yeah. Right now, I've committed to a date that I am certain I can deliver to mm-hmm. unless, you know, force majeure events happen again. Um, I, I can't, I, I can't and won't make someone work when their father has just died. It is fundamentally wrong. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to apologize for having that position. I will apologize for it being late, but I'm not going to apologize for having that position. Mm -hmm. Not ever. Um, and I think that anyone asks me to has not thought it through. Oh, yeah. So uh, I should say no one has asked me to, but if anyone were to, I think I think they would not have thought through the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I am always very cognizant of the fact that people have paid me money to make this the reality. And given the era forbidden is actually my 60th Kickstarter. I am no further away from the reality of what Kickstarter means and the level of trust that people are showing me when they back one of my Kickstarters than I was the first time I ran Kickstarter. You know, the the first Kickstarter I ran, I was aware of all these things. And if anything, I would say my view is stronger now that delivering is just the most important thing. Now, some people might validly be sitting there and thinking, okay, okay, Ed, um, you are, you've just admitted you're behind on Era Lost Legend, you're behind on Era Survival, why the hell are you running another Kickstarter? That is a valid question. And there is a very simple reason. 2020 has been hard for everyone. But, for me, 
I can control what I work on. And in a pinch, yes, I can be a proofreader. Yes, I can do uh, various graphic design tasks and so on. I am currently in a situation where Era Lost Legend is sitting with the printer to get it right. There is nothing I can do about that. Mm -hmm. Except phone them every day, give them smart, snarky emails, go, hey, come on, get your act together, get this sorted. Why is this taking so long? Come on! But during that time... And, and with Era Survival, I am in the process of writing the fourth of... No, sorry, the fifth of six expansions. Should I not look forward to what comes next? Because I know that this is going to be a month late. Uh, I, I should say, I committed to delivery of the digital expansions by the end of the year. I will certainly have delivered all of the digital expansions, uh, one, two, three, and four of six. I will have mm -hmm. delivered four of the six all by right. the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Given the initial goal was three expansions mm -hmm. that I said I'd deliver by the end of the year, is it ridiculous I've delivered four and not six? I don't know. I think this is a gray area. Mm -hmm. um, I have run into this gray area before. Um... I should say, complete hands-in-the-air honesty, the four expansions I'm delivering, one of them, one of the three that I initially promised is not part of those four. Mm -hmm. So I'm delivering four expansions that I know I will get done by the end of the year. I may also get a fifth done by the end of the year. Um, but I will... Um, I may... The I, I have said right from the start, one of the three that I promised initially, I'm doing lost. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm I'm doing that. I'm doing that last. I'm do, I've got very good reasons. It's actually the fastest to do. Right, um, and I've been very transparent with everyone who's backed the project right from the beginning that I'm going to do this one last. So if the sixth expansion, if, even if the fifth and sixth expansions of six mm -hmm. come out a little late, I think it's a grey area. But Era Forbidden will not need to be late because these are late. They're late because of reasons that were obviously beyond my control, yes. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I have accounted for the lateness in both Era Lost Legend and Era Survival when thinking about what the timescale that I will commit to for Era, Lost, uh, Era Forbidden is. Yeah. And I am very confident that I can deliver Era Forbidden, certainly on the timescale that I'm delivering... Uh, that I'm saying in the Kickstarter, which is a year. I don't think I need anything like that time. Uh, the the book, you know, the shell of the book is already done. It exists as the pocket rule book. Mm -hmm. I need to expand it. I need to do a lot of writing. That's true. I am very, very confident. And I have thought over this very, very carefully. But at the end of the day, with no conventions, meaning minimal sales that we've made, mm -hmm. with no sort of support from the community in general um, because everyone is short of money. I am struggling financially to keep my business running. Mm -hmm. I believe that I can deliver Era Forbidden strongly. I have built the business of Shades of Vengeance and, and Era D10. I have built it on Kickstarter. To begin to fail to deliver Kickstarters is very, very dangerous for me from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. I have so many more ideas that I want to do. I have so many more things that I want to do. I have no intention of allowing this to be the place where I fail. But right now, I desperately need that £2,500 so that I can... Begin building not only Era Forbidden, but also work on a variety of other bits and pieces to make sure that the pipeline keeps going. Because mm -hmm. I know that I know that I could go, okay, I'm stopping everything. And then next year, for a year's time or more, you would have absolutely nothing from me. I would just stop. Yeah. 
But I really don't want that to be the case. I think there are more ideas to come out. I want to do more survival expansions. I want to do more empowered expansions. I want to do more consortium expansions. I want to do stuff for Lost Legend. I want to do... Uh, I've got a pocket rulebook idea. Two pocket rulebooks idea. R- rulebook ideas. Um, that I'd like to do. And... I've got audio dramas, which literally cost nothing once you have the equipment and you have the voice actors um, working with you. So there's a lot of stuff I want to do, and I don't want role-playing games to stop being a thing we do because we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And right now, if I didn't run the Era Forbidden Kickstarter, or possibly one of the other things I looked at was an Era the Empowered Definitive Edition rulebook, because it is about time for that. Mm-hmm. If I didn't do one of those two things, I would be shutting down role-playing games for the foreseeable future. Uh, we, we can play, but forget about any new material. And I don't want Shades of Vengeance to stop producing role-playing games. So, in summary, I've given you a very long and rambly answer. I've, I've <laughs> revealed a lot about the internal workings. <laughs> I... I'm running this Kickstarter because I need to run it, and I am running a Kickstarter that I believe that I can deliver. Mm -hmm. I would not be running the Kickstarter if I did not believe I can deliver it firmly, 100%. What has happened is two projects that are currently in existence that are pending. I've delivered bits for... uh, Three projects, I should say. Mm -hmm. Um, Because there's Era Lost Legend, there is Era Survival. No, it's two projects. What am I talking about? Ha! Two projects. Era, Era Lost Legend and Era Survival. I have delivered the digital for Era Lost Legend totally on time, no problem. Mm-hmm. I am not going to be able to deliver the printed versions on time for reasons that are genuinely beyond my control. And I cannot express easily how much that angers me. Um, it is not It is not the printer's fault particularly. Yes, they could do better, but... They are under difficult circumstances. It is COVID-19. Yeah. And and COVID-19, for that reason, makes me more angry about this. Um, and then there is Era Survival. And the material will be written by the end of the year. But as I said, I am not going to apologize for not insisting that someone works when their father has just died. It's mm-hmm. not okay. Um, I'm I'm not going to insist on that, and I'm 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 not going to apologise for not insisting either. So yes, Era Survival is going to be slightly late as a result of that, and that's no one's fault either. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, slight delays, very very slight, especially in Kickstarter terms, because a lot of Kickstarters deliver years late. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about a month, two months maximum. Mm-hmm. And that is based on print times for the most part. So the digital forbidden, my aim currently, my aim in my mind, yes, I want it done by May 2021. Um, we have always scheduled our releases around the conventions that take place in the UK. Despite the fact conventions are not taking place in the UK, I have not changed my position on when we release things. Mm -hmm. failing that it will be ready for october and there is literally no way it can fail yeah um there is so much less to do than there was for era lost legend and i have the same time scales um big and when i say less again i use the era lost legend core rulebook in the video as an example for a reason oh that's tomorrow (laughs) hasn't come out yet um as of recording but um I used the Era Lost Legend rulebook in a video to describe what the Era Forbidden Core rulebook will look like. And I used it for a reason because I believe they're going to look similar. Mm -hmm. Um, They're going to have similar kinds of content and they're going to be a similar length. And what you can expect from Era Forbidden is what you are expecting from Era Lost Legend. And like half of the work is done. So I'm very confident that given that Era Lost Legend is on time, barring the print, I am very confident that Era Forbidden will be on time. And that is why I am running this Kickstarter. 
I think it is a fair question to ask, and I think that people should be able to answer it if they're doing what I'm doing. Yeah, that I that um that makes sense. And I'll be keeping a close eye on how, on how things develop, and I'll definitely be looking forward to the um, the eventual release of um, Forbidden. But with with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you once again for um, being willing to come back to the temple. It's always a tr it's always a treat to have you back here in these hallowed halls. Um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me, and uh, I hope to be back again soon. Mm -hmm. um, it's beginning to feel like a second home. <laughs> I pre I appreciate that. Um, we all need a holiday home right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and and of course and of course you you know how you know how it goes around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Indeed. Oh. Indeed. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>